I hold the world but as the world, a stage where every man has to play a part. Do you know who wrote those famous words? Well, it's that man over there, William Shakespeare. It's from a play called The Merchant of Venice and it was written more than 400 years ago. It's a very long time. By this man, William Shakespeare. They call him the Bard. And he is perhaps the most well-known author in this whole wide world. And why am I telling you all this? Because we are talking about literature. Literature is an art, just like painting, sculpture, photography, music and so on. But unlike music for instance, which has to do with sound, literature makes use of language. Therefore, literary works have to be read, well, except plays, of course, which need to be acted out, but it still makes use of language. Literature can help you develop a love for reading. It can help you become more aware of your own abilities and your attitudes. You can gain insight into what being human is all about, thus put you in a better position to make judgments. In other words, literature can help you understand yourself better, understand the people around you better, and ultimately allow you to understand the whole world at large. Literature is something alive. It depicts situations, feelings, impulses, and the general human experiences that, and imagination that everyone is familiar with. Phew, did you get all that? Well, if you didn't get what I said, Here's a summary. The Malaysian curriculum for secondary school offers what is called Literature in English program. This simply means that students will be required to read uh, books or texts in English and this will be examinable at SPM level. Get it? Okay, it simply means that you will have to read certain books or texts that have been selected and you will need to respond to these texts creatively. And just how do you do that? Simple, through activities like play acting, reciting poems and writing. One more graphic for you. Right, do you know what I did? I decided to do some homework to find out how much people know about a novel called The, the Old Man and the Sea. And here's what I got. <laughs> what? You call me an old man? I have read the book but I can't remember the story. Is that the same story as the man from Atlantis? You know, the man who lives at the bottom of the sea? <laughs> I can't. Anyway, since none of those people could tell me much about the old man and the sea, I decided to have a special guest with us today to help us out. Hello, Puan City. Hello. Um, could you tell us something about the author, Ernest Hemingway? Yes, of course. Ernest Hemingway was born on July 21st, 1899. Had he been alive today, he would have, would have been, what, a, more, more than, than 100 years, years old. Hmm? Yes. He was born in the village of Oak Park, Illinois. Now, as a writer, you can see that a lot of his life influenced what he writes. As a young child, I'm sure he'd enjoyed nature rambles mm -hmm. right, um, in his village and um, his writing talent could be seen right from the uh, you know from childhood he wrote for his school newspaper 
And then later on, when he graduated, he became a newspaper reporter. Mm -hmm. And he reported on things that mattered to him, or that matters a lot to him. When we talk about his novels and his short stories, we, we realize that a lot of the substance that you can find in his novels and short stories come from his own life experiences, right? He went through two world wars, right? Two world wars, World War I and World War II. In World War I, um, well, during the uh, 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 World War I, he, he became an ambulance driver. Mm. And he was serving the Austrian-Italian front. And if I'm not mistaken, that was when he fell in love with his own, yes, he met and fell in love with his own nurse. Um, you know, unfortunately, they broke up later. And I think it was a very tragic, very dramatic kind of experience for impact. him. Yes, mm -hmm. it had a very large impact on his life, yes. So much so that it came out in one of the novels that he wrote. If you happen to have read um, A Farewell to Arms, you realize that this was part of his life you know, uh, during that war. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the 1920s, his writing was uh, very much influenced by um, writers of that time, notably Gertrude Stein and Ezra Pound. Right. These two people or these two writers had a very strong influence on Hemingway's own writings, his style of writing. If you, if you read his short stories, you read his novels, you can almost um, see that there are three very great influences in his writings. One is, um, you know, um, about um, bullfighting. yeah, bullfighting. Yes, uh, there's something in his writing that refers to all these things: bullfighting, big game hunting, you know, deer hunting. Uh, you know, mm. yes, and also deep sea, deep sea fishing. All right, and, um, and now these are all written based on the experiences he had gone through. Okay, uh, um, uh, and then after World War Two, many thought that well. You know, he can't write any, any better from now on mm. because he was already getting old. But surprisingly, his best novel yet, he wrote The Old Man and the Sea. After, and after yeah. World War II, when everybody thought that, you know, he, he wasn't going to write. Lost touch. Yes, mm. he's lost touch with, with uh, literary style and things like that. But no, The Old Man and the Sea won him first the Pulitzer Prize in 1952. And then two years following that, he won the Nobel Prize, 1954, right? He won the Nobel Prize for his, now I quote here, powerful style, <coughs> making mastery of the art of modern narration, right? So that's something, um, you know, something very um, interesting and something worth noting, okay? Um, unfortunately, you know, all his personal tragic experiences began to take a toll on his life. Yes, influenced his, on his personal, well, influenced his personal life. Mm. Eventually, he took his own life in July 1961. He killed himself. He shot himself. Yes, he shot himself in Ketchum, Idaho, mm. which is tragic, right? Tragic for the literary world. But, well, his works went on. Students are still reading his, his novels, analyzing his works, and some of his novels, some of his uh, uh, works have been translated into various foreign languages, not English, but other languages as well. Mm -hmm. So that's very important, yes. What about the novel itself? Could you tell us something about it? The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Now, the story of The Old Man and the Sea is actually very simple. It's, it's basically about an old, uh, well, a fisherman, right? a fisherman with his young friend, right, a, a little boy, and how this fisherman tried to catch a big fish, huge fish. For days, he couldn't get any fish, so much so that everybody thought, or he himself even thought that 
her he must be cursed. What, cursed yes because he couldn't catch any fish and the young boy uh, was asked by his parents to work for someone else for another fisherman because well they they depend on fish for the livelihood yeah. so if there's no fish there's no money coming in so the boy went to work for someone else and this old man was left by himself mm -hmm. right to um catch fish you know just try and catch catch fish and eventually he managed to hook a very large fish it's so large that you know he uh, instead of the fisherman uh, the the right. old man pulling the, the fish, fish into the boat the fish dragged the boat out into the open sea right and eventually he managed to catch the fish but the interesting part of this story is you get to see all the thoughts that went through this old man's head while he was waiting for the fish to tire out mm. you know eventually the fish became tired and he managed to catch the fish but the fish was so big so huge that he could pull it into his boat he had to you know tie the fish alongside his boat mm -hmm. right so i'm not going to tell everybody what you mm. know how it ends it's up to you to read it because there are a lot of interesting things you know while he was um, you know pulling the fish back to shore um so let's say that i have read this novel mm -hmm. and i'm going to take a test or an exam mm -hmm. what sort of questions could i be expected to answer okay right now basically when you read a novel of course you will need to know <coughs> about uh, you know the the basic aspects of a novel some of this uh, would include for example what the story is about mm -hmm. right the plot, the plot who the characters are all right what the characters are like mm -hmm. and um, you know uh, what kind of language yes whether there are any symbols or not what kind of of uh, you know um, imagery or you know what kind of of, of uh, language uh, um, uh, is used by the writer all right so basically this is what you need to know all right you need to uh, to to uh, understand mm -hmm. now some of the questions that you may be asked about this text all right for example okay uh, why was Manolin forbidden to go fishing with old santiago santiago is the name of the old man all right mm -hmm. so well first well, who's Manolin? You've got to find out, all right? And then why was he forbidden to go fishing with O Santiago? Mm -hmm. Or discuss with clear reference to the text the special relationship that existed between the old man and the big fish that he caught. Now, mm -hmm. we very seldom talk about our relationship with an animal or a fish. But here, you may be asked that question. That means that it is important to understand what kind of rela relationship Mm -hmm. you can interpret in this story all right between the man and the, uh, the fish okay. okay thank you madam so okay. there you have it everything that you wanted to know about the old man and the sea well not actually everything but at least enough to have to have you pick up the book and read it so get the book and read it and just where would you find this book you can try it at your school library or simply ask your English language teacher for it. Okay, enough of Ernest Hemingway. Let's go back to the master author, Mr. Shakespeare. Mr. Shakespeare, can you tell us something about yourself? Well, there's not very much to tell really. I was born in Stratford upon Avon in 1564, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. I left Stratford when I was a young man to seek my fortune in London. I was there for about 20 years, and in that time, I wrote about 37 plays, comedies, tragedies, histories. And I was fortunate to have had time to write some poems and sonnets as well. Do you know that I was an actor and a businessman too? 
I'm particularly interested in one of your comedies, Twelfth Night. Can you tell all our curious viewers something about it? I would be delighted to. I consider Twelfth Night to be one of my timeless comedies. It speaks to the lighter side of our emotions and gently prods us to admit our senseless pride, confess our petty jealousies, and above all, celebrate our loves. I actually wrote this romantic comedy as a play to be performed on the twelfth day of Christmas. Well, the main plot revolves around the mistaken identity of the brother-sister twin, Sebastian and Viola. The comic underplot involves the galling of the self-righteous and puritanical Malvolio, his humiliation at the hands of Maria, Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, and Fabian. Ooh, that sounds interesting. And interesting it is. Well, let's see how it looks like if it's dramatized. We couldn't act out the whole play for you, so we chose this hilarious scene from Act 2, Scene 5. Set in Olivia's garden, we will see Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, Fabian, and Maria about to play a trick on Malvolio. Here it comes. Come by way, Signor Fabian. Nay, I'll come. If I lose a scruple of this sport, let me be bought to death with melancholy. Would well, thou not be black, said the niggly rascal sheep biter? Come by some nose for shame. I would exalt, man. You know he brought me out of favour with my lady. About a bear baiting here. <sighs> to anger him with the bear again. Oh, boy, in black and blue, shall we not, Andrew? If we do not, it is the pity of our lives. Here comes the new villain. How now, my mother of India? Get your tree into the box tree. No volume's coming down this walk. He's been yonder in the sun, practising behaviour to his own shadow this <laughs> half hour. Observe him for the love of mockery. Lie thou there, for here comes the trap that must be caught with chicken. Tis but fortune, all is fortune. Maria once told me she did affect me, and I've heard to tell come thus near. That your chief fancy, it will be one of my complexions. <laughs> Besides, she uses me for a more exalted respect than any other that follows her. What shall I think on? Just an overweening robe. Oh, peace. Contemplation makes a rare turkey cock of him. How he jets under his advanced plume. Slide I could so good the robe. Peace, I say. To me, Count Malvolio. Ah, rogue! Pistol him, pistol him! Peace, peace. There is example for it. The lady of the Strachy married the yeoman of the wardrobe. Fie on him, Jezebel! Oh, peace! Now he's deeply in. Look how imagination blows him. <laughs> After being married three months to her, sitting in my seat, Oh, for Storbo, hit him in the eye! Calling my officers about me, in my branch, Velvet gown, having come from a David, who has left Olivia sleeping. Fire and brimstone! Oh, peace, peace! And then, to have the humour of state, and after a demure travel of regard, telling them, I know my place, as I would, if they should do dear. Bolts and shackles! Oh, peace, peace, peace! Now, now! Say, Cousin Toby, my fortunes having cast me on your knees, give me the prerogative of speech. What? What? You must demand your drunkenness. Up, scab! Nay, patience, or we break the silence of our plot. Besides, you waste the treasures of your time with a foolish knight. That's me, I warrant you. One, Sir Andrew. I knew it was I for many. Don't call me a fool. <laughs> What employment have we here? Now is the woodcock near the gin. Oh, peace, and the spirit of humor's intimate reading aloud to him. By my life, this is my lady's hand. Here, very cease. 
Hey, you then have tea. And else makes she a great piece. It is in contempt of question her hand. Jove knows thy love, but who? Lips do not move. No man must know. No man must know. What follows? The number's altered. No man must know if this should be deemed a royal. Marry Henry Brock. I may command where I adore, but silence like a Lucrece knife. The bloodless stroke my heart doth gore. M O A I doth say my life. A filthy and riddle. Excellent wench, say I. M O A I doth say my life. Nay, but first, let me see, let me see, let me see. What dish of poison has she dressed in? And with what wing the stain who checked at it? I may command where I adore. Why she may command me? I serve her. She is my lady. Hmm. Why, this is evident to any former capacity. There is no obstruction in this. And yet, what should that alphabetical position pretend? If I can make that resemble something in me, softly, M O A I. Oh, A, make up that. He's now at a cold scent. Salt will cry upon it for all this, though it be as rank as a fox. M Melvolio. M. Why, that begins my name. Did not I say he would work it out? The curse, excellent as fox. M. But then there's no consonancy in a sequel that suffers under probation. A should follow. But O does. And O shall end, I hope. A of cudgel him and make him cry, oh! And then I come to hide. A and you had any eye behind you, you might see more detraction at your heels. Then fortunes before you. M O E I. The simulation is not as the former, and yet to crush this a little, it'll bow to me for every one of these letters are in my name. Soft. Here follows close. If this fall into thy hand, revolve, in my stars I am above thee. But be not afraid of greatness. Some have gone great, some achieved greatness, and some have greatness trust upon them. Thy fates open their hands, that thy blood and spirit embrace them. And to inure thyself to what thou art like to be, cast thy humble slough and appear fresh. Be opposite of kinsmen, surly servants, let thy tongue Ten arguments of state, put thyself into a trick of singularity. She thus advises thee that sighs for thee. Remember who commanded thy yellow stockings <laughs> and wished to see thee ever cross guarded. <laughs> I say, remember, go to dark mate. If thou desirest to be so, if not, let me see thee a steward still. The fellow servants are not worthy to touch fortune's fingers. Farewell. She that would alter services with thee. The fortunate are happy. Here is yet a postscript. Thou canst not choose but know who I am. If thou entertains my love, let it appear in thy smile. <laughs> thy smiles become thee well. Therefore, my presence to smile, dear my sweet, I prithee. Joe, <laughs> I thank thee. I will smile. I'll do everything that thou wilt of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give my part of this sport for a pension of thousands to be paid from the sofa. 
I could marry this wench for this device. So could I too. And ask for no other dowry with her. But such is not a chance. Nor I neither. Here comes my noble gal catcher. Will thou set thy foot on my neck? Or of my neither. Shall I play my freedom at trade and be thy bond slave? In faith or I either. Why? Thou hast put him in such a dream. <laughs> though when the image leaves him, he must run mad. Nay, but say true. Just to work upon him. Like echo beats him with a midwife. <sighs> if you will then see the fruit of the sport, mark his first approach before my lady. He will come to her in yellow stockings <laughs> and to the color shoe. <laughs> and cross garters, a fashion she detests. Mm. And he will smile upon her which will now be so unsuitable to her disposition that it cannot but turn him into a notable contempt. If you will see it, follow me. To the gate of Tata, the most excellent devil of wit, I'll make one too. Wow, what a nasty trick. But I guess Marvel, you deserved what he got. Now, let's assume that you have read the novel Twelfth Night. Let's also assume that you are going to take the literature and English paper in the SPM examination. What sort of questions would you expect? Here are two questions that you might want to think about. So we've discussed a novel and a play and that's just two of a whole lot of books that we call literature in English. And do you know what? We still need to look at poetry and short stories. And the good news is we are going to do that in seasons two, which will be coming your way very soon. Here are some famous last words from me. Literature has an educational purpose. It provides more than just knowledge. It builds bridges in communication. It takes you beyond sentences and words. It, I could go on forever, but nothing is going to happen to you if you do not read. So read, read, read. It will make a difference in your life.